so hi everyone I'm just waiting for Elena to join oh uh, she's here hi hello hi again hi how are you good to see you good to see you too thank you is everything all right with the yes. sound and video i hear you good uh, i hope okay. everything is correct right with me as well yes it is yeah great yeah so thank you alina for tonight for being here and uh, having this live uh, as i said before i think there is not a lot of the stuff about uh, using tab children when you search uh on the google or youtube or anywhere so i'm hoping that this live will be uh, so useful for a lot of people thank you for your invitation um i feel really honored uh, to speak with you and uh, to have uh, the audience that i'm seeing now uh, i also yeah. ha- uh, hope it's going to be useful um now that i hear you say uh, that there are not so many informations uh, Yeah. I feel like it's a long journey since I I thought the same as you. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, I think I lost you. I lost you for one uh, one second. Yeah, uh Am I back now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, uh do you want to give us uh, a little bit of introduction of your background? Uh how did you start working with TA and Gestalt, I know. Am I right? Is Gestalt play therapy? Yes, it's it's just a yeah. part of Gestalt. Yeah. Okay. um i started very young i think and early uh it's almost 12 years ago when i was uh in um my studies of um educational my first bachelor degree is in pedagogy and uh there it was a teacher who told us about ta when talking mm. about parenting so this was my first encounter with uh, burn and what do you say after you say hello yeah and i think that was also the time when i decided to follow ta uh in romania because this is my homeland now i'm living mm. in the netherlands but um everything that i study was in romania um and i think then i wanted to work with adults I always mm. wanted to work with children but as you said um except for mm. the parenting uh, and um lots of concepts that you can use with adults to look back there re- yeah. there was not so much about doing therapy with children in TA even more some of my trainers said mm. no Alina this is not possible Uh, and i think this is the reason uh why i started also to do gestalt play therapy because i had lots of theory from ta uh but it was um almost impossible to apply it with children because yeah children and, th- and theory and talking are not working yeah yeah so then i made like a, a bridge between ta and gestalt in order to have a uh, more techniques and um in order to find ways to work with children using TA as a background theory mm. and then i discover a very nice and big community of TA people in italy and oh. they are all specialized in working with children wow yes yes so i i am going to italy every summer except of last summer with uh, with corona uh, in the end of august there is a congress and we are all gathering there and they are all the time speaking about doing ta with children 
Mm-hmm. Um, one of the biggest name, and it was a pleasure to meet Dolores Monari Poda. Uh, mm. She was working with children, but now she is retired, and she she is the founder of the Congress in La Barone. And also a great name and uh, resource is uh, Alessandra Pierini. She wrote an article yeah. in Taj, uh, TAG, about working with children and the differences between uh, working with adults. Mm. Uh, then I discovered that there are lots of authors who are writing about TA with children. Uh, but unfortunately, all the literature is in Italian. So, oh. Yeah. Yeah. So did you learn Italian? Well, I am a Romanian. So a Romanian and Italian have in common the Latin language. And oh. Yeah. So when I went, uh, when I uh, arrived there the first time, I had a, a translator. Uh, but he was not actually a translator. So at a certain time, it was difficult for him and for me. And I said, mm. I think I'm understanding enough. So I was writing one word in Italian, one in Romanian, and that was the first year. <laughs> and yeah, then I started to, to have some lessons in Italian as well, so I can uh, understand more and more. Uh, and this is how I did it, I think. Yeah, wow. So interesting. I didn't know about that. I, I was uh, in the I- IATA conference uh, a week ago, and there was a... Uh, keynote speech about the Italian community of uh, social, social cognitive school of TA, mm-hmm. the large C. And it was really fascinating how um, it was research based, evidence based work there. Yeah. They are working really hard, and in Italy, there are seven schools of TA. Oh, the wow. TA is very good spread all over the country. Yeah. And uh, there is a lot to learn from them. I think they are doing a great job. Yeah. And, then, and now I'm thinking there is a lot even to translate from them. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, you got that insight from TA and you made it practical with the Gestalt. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The first thing that comes to my mind when I think about working TA with children is that how do you use that language or how do you translate those jargon for children? How different do you do that? I think you don't, actually. You don't. Oh. You don't. You don't translate the TA language mm-hmm. uh, because that the um, how to say the language of the children is play and play. Play, yeah. Yes. So they speak through play, and um, with uh, teenagers and adolescents, I learn them some TA because I think it's really useful. So they could have um, mm-hmm. something to put. Uh, also on the table and use for development or their their metacognition and their thinking. Yeah. But with small children, we don't um, speak that much, but we speak through play and to creativity and to uh, drawings and storytelling and their language is more symbolic. Mm-hmm. So do you want to ha- may explain some of the examples of how do you symbolize those ego states or maybe uh, in the play? First, I think the main difference between doing therapy with an adult and with a child is that I don't use the same model of the ego states. Mm. So the model of burn in doing TA with children is replaced uh, or I replace it uh, in my work as well with the model of Romanini. She wrote mm-hmm. uh, about the concept of real ego state. Because when oh. you work with a child, um, you work from child, from the child of the therapist, with the yeah. child within the client, which is the child. Yeah, yeah. So basically it's not A2, it's C2. Yeah. I, I made before a drawing because it looks really different. It's yeah. not linear. So you have the child in the middle 
You have the mm -hmm. parents and you have the adults. Yeah. That, yeah, that means that the, the whole relation is concentrated on a child-child ego state and not an adult-adult. Of course, you use also adult-adult, but this is not something that you use all the time or you focus on. Mm. Mm. Because most of the time, if you speak about uh, contaminations, yeah. the contaminations are different. So they come from parenting of state, of course, but they come also from adult ego state. Oh, yeah. So the contamination is when the child cannot use the child capacity. Exactly. Which Fully. is creativity, creativity, being able to, sh uh, to freely share his ideas, being able to be and having the permission to be a child. Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm um, really getting the answer of one of my questions that how do you make assessment? Mm, evaluation, you mean? Yeah, how do you assess or diagnose with children? Mm -hmm. that... Except from the uh, DSM. Uh, from TA, I use a lot of contamination and uh, everything that is regarding the script. Like uh -huh. the script injunctions, uh, permissions. Um, because one of, uh, as well, the differences between working with adults and with children is the, the difference of the, the, the three P, like the permission, protection, and potency. Potency. Yeah. And when you work with children, you add the fourth P, which is mm -hmm. prevention. So oh. when I make the diagnose, I also put the prevention, for example, of the script because a child is a very neuroplastic in yeah. his development of the brain, but also uh, in the development of the script. Actually, we have in front a part of his script. Hmm. Hmm. So then the therapist, when he's doing the assessment, is also working a lot on prevention of uh, forming a... Um, contaminated script uh, with a very bad payoff, let's say, for the child. Yeah. And in assessing, I, I take a lot into consideration uh, doing the prevention work. Hmm. And how does this, uh, is this assessment different when you think about that cycles of development? I, I see that you talk about that a lot in your posts. Yes, and it yes. gives some very useful information in the I love the cycle of development. I think yeah. this was the, the TA concept that helped me a lot, especially as a young mother, because it was really interesting to see it also for my daughter. I have a 10 mm. years old daughter. Yeah. Uh, and also because I work a lot with parents, when working with children, it's impossible not to work with the parents as well. Um, I like Levin's uh, model of um, cycle of development, but also Clark, because she developed um, one that is more specific for my work. Uh, yeah. And the way I use it is uh, looking at the cycle of development at the child real age versus the needs and what he is expressing uh, to the symptoms, uh, because a child is bringing some symptoms into the office. Hmm. But underlying the symptoms, there are some relational needs most of the time. Oh, wow, yeah. The, by relational needs, do you mean that relational needs of Richard Erskine, yeah? Yeah, also of Richard Erskine, yeah. yeah. Oh, but, but not, they... only, not only to him. Uh, mm, I think most of the, the relational part of our work, I think children are relational and this is a big point. It's impossible mm. to take the child out of the family when you work with the child. So this relation yeah. needs that he's uh, uh, having a gap maybe with are regarding mostly to parents or to kindergarten teachers or to school teachers or people very close in his environment. Yeah, that's right. And I also wanted to ask you about the relational work because I know you are so interested in uh, uh, Helena Hargadon's work and uh, yeah, all yeah. those relational uh, perspective to the human. 
So how does that, uh, what does the relational uh, aspect or perspective add to your work? I think that the permission to be close, mm -hmm. close to, to the client in my work and also to let myself being impacted um, by the client and by, by the work mm. that we are doing. And with a child, I think it's almost impossible not to be impacted. There yeah. are so many things that a child uh, is touching in you, even if you want or don't want. And all the parents, I think they can agree that a child can touch uh, your uh, highest nerves sometimes. And some yeah. parts of the script that we uh, hide very good. Mm -hmm. And I think this, uh, this relational approach is, um, has enriched a lot my work by um, understanding more, more of the unconscious parts that they are not visible. Hmm. Yeah. What is really the child trying to say? Uh, what is the transference level? What is my counter transference? Yeah, that's interesting to think of it when you are also in your child ego state. So you say when you are playing, it's a child child transaction. Yes. And how does this, this transference happening? Sometimes you have goosebumps, uh, other times uh, uh, you have uh, chicken skin, <laughs> other times you feel feelings that are not yours. And I think mm. this is very interesting for me uh, to feel uh, sadness when I don't feel sad. Wow. Also happens through maybe to the uh, mirror neurons to, to have a tear out of the sudden. And I think this part of the counter-transference is uh, informing me a lot about uh, what is possible to be in the other one. And sometimes I'm, I'm saying it. I'm feeling these feelings. How about you? Yeah. So you're making the connection with the children to maybe make that capacity of mentalizing yeah, like a process of digesting, I think. Hmm. And then put it back to the other. Yeah, that's really interesting because um, I myself haven't really thought about uh, how is it different to work with children. And this is also new to me to yeah hear about that. And as you say, how how is it different to be uh, impacted by the children yes rather than by an adult I think uh, the therapist who is working with children needs to have a, a permission from the inner parent to be free yeah. to be joyful yeah. in the same time to have the, the protection of the parent for himself mm. Because uh, it's a lot of uh, a vulnerability hidden in uh, our inner child. That's yeah, right. and and actually, when we don't feel safe, we can um, transfer it to another another person or the child. Transferring or um, what I experienced, especially in the beginning, uh, is not seeing some things. Hmm. Because sometimes it's so painful that you don't want to see things. Oh, can you make an example? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of, of a girl. Uh, she was five when uh, we worked, um, I think, more than seven years ago. And at a certain point, I took supervision because uh, she was really hating her brother. Um, and what she was feeling was so much loneliness. Hmm. Because she was the biggest child, uh, she was paying less, uh, less it was paying less uh, attention to her. And then um, I was not seeing this loneliness because it was also my loneliness. It was wow. really interesting when uh, exploring in supervision, uh, what might she feel, uh, how, to, how it is for her to, to be left a bit outside. 
Mm, I was not seeing yeah. this. I was focusing on the behavior or what needs to be done, how she can integrate more and more, how the symptom can go away because uh, the symptom was also some uh, anuresis uh, during the day as well. Yeah. 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 I think this is the, the trick when you focus too much uh, on the symptom and not on what is not expressed. Yeah, what you're discounting actually, maybe. Or exactly. what you're, yeah. So now I'm thinking, uh, as for a therapist, it's uh, of course very important to have personal therapy and get to know themselves very well. And But what you're explaining is something that is always happening between a mother and a child. Yes. Yes. Yeah. How did you experience that with your own child I mean I want other <laughs> yeah this is a tough question um, it's beginning more uh, to be more tough as she's uh, almost a, a teenager um, I think she, the relationship with my daughter was um, the motivation to start uh, thinking of doing therapy with children because she was almost uh, two years old and mm. I wanted to learn her about emotions and I realized I have no idea how to explain this difficult language <laughs> that you asked me. How do you do? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so it, it, it has lots of impact. Uh, I think uh, as a mother and in the relationship, you can understand more, maybe more than other mothers who are not um, aware of, about the theory and everything behind. But in yeah. terms of transference, this transference and counter-transference, I think is, is the same difficult. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Yes, it's something that's always happening, whether we are aware of it or not. Uh, now, now I can feel my own emotions <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's one question that one of my friends asked me and I wanted to ask it. Uh, uh, from you. Uh, uh, how does TA help with children uh, with autism or ADHD? Mm. Uh, I don't know if there are studies with uh, um, like research. Uh, I mm. know someone who is doing uh, in Italy who is working with children with autism. It is not my, my spec spectrum. I'm not working with them oh, because, okay. uh, because I believe uh, that TA has its own limitations and yeah, when, sure. when it's uh, about working with children I think there are lots of things to be discovered um, after this live I can give you the contact so maybe it's really interesting to talk with someone who is integrating in her work yeah uh, autism I am working with children with uh, HDHD but not severe one hmm. Uh, I worked uh, for a period because um, I had uh, an experience in working in an orphanage in Romania. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, as I said, TA has its own limitations. Now, there are yeah. some things that can be explained, um, that you can make correlations, you can uh, have the diagnose uh, using TA language and using TA concepts. But I yeah. think there is more, uh, more regarding the research part and also the interventions. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for making it clear. Yeah. And uh, another thing is about uh, a script and the, the, the big theory of a script and everything that we have. And as when you're working with children, uh, how do you see that formation of early script? And how is this mm -hmm. different with adolescents? You know? You mean uh, um, small children and adolescents? Yeah, both of them. How is it different, you know? Um, I, I, it's something that's interesting for me is the uh, work of Giles Barrow and his mm -hmm. focus on adolescents and how the uh, script decisions in adolescents can be uh, also powerful as mm -hmm. early childhood. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is an important period of time. Yeah, I think this is why I mentioned prevention. Uh, 
because when I'm meeting uh-huh. a child and you do the assessment and you think of the injunctions, for example. Yeah. Uh, Pierini said that uh, the therapist who is working with the child is a hero on a contract. Mm. Because the children are all the time making up stories. And sometimes therapy with children, with small children or until 10, it's all around the story. It's easier yeah. to be the um, character in a story than to be yourself sometimes. Uh, and as a therapist, I can see the injunctions. So my way is to give more permissions and to uh, facilitate a, a better relationship with the parents and a better understanding about what is happening. Um, yeah. I, I say all the time that until 10, it's a, it's a thing with parent and a child together. It's really difficult to separate. And the way mm. I work, like a, in a pragmatical way, is uh, I'm having a, a first meeting with a parent where I do the assessment of the parent and what they need and what is the symptom that they are bringing uh, yeah. in therapy. Then I do three, four sessions of evaluation of the child. And then uh, mm-hmm. after that, uh, I do a meeting with the parents again and present a, a treatment plan. Mm-hmm. And in this treatment plan, I'm also considering the script and what is the payoff of the script. Yeah. Sometimes the payoff can, can sound like nobody's loving me no matter what uh, I would do. Mm-hmm. Or I feel left uh, aside. Uh, and I think it's very important that the, the therapist uh, who is working with the children to be attentive of the payoff of the script. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the difference when working with adolescents, and uh, here I am using the model of Levin, because she wrote uh, in the um, uh, TAG an article about the ego states in adolescents. And I was really interesting, uh, interested in that. Uh, and I like her explanation. Uh, what she is saying is that in adolescence, you basically take again all the cycles of development and you have the chance of regeneration. I think this mm. is also the title of uh, the article, Regeneration. So I, I, mm. made, uh, I made for myself um, a theory that could help me when working with uh, um, teenagers and uh, I start from uh, uh, the ego states of um, Romanini, the ones that I show earlier, these yeah. ones. Yeah. And then I, I draw a big uh, bridge uh, until the ego states of burn and this bridge is called liminal space. So the adolescents mm. in my opinion are in a liminal space where uh, they have this big opportunity of finding themselves again and redeciding who they are, who they yeah. want to be, how they want to do things. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's fascinating how much information now we have of neuroscience and how the brain is developing in that ages. The process of pruning that happens mm-hmm. in the end of adolescence. And how, and how can this be fit into these models of using that? I especially more, this development I, I i think that the more they experience uh, the more their brain develops and I, I am inspired by a book i don't remember now the title but uh, it made the difference between the adolescence of uh, mammals and human uh-huh. adolescence. and the the highlight of the book is that if you don't risk you don't learn so it mm. is very important that adolescents are able to have experience. To have new experiences and risk, yeah. Yes, yes. And I see it yeah. uh, with the terms of uh, neuroscience uh, regarding uh, building of, uh, and construction of the frontal lobe. So we know that this frontal lo- lobe is not uh, already constructed or finished by 24. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the adolescents are more developing. fast. Exactly. They are more fast. They are uh, not thinking in terms of uh, consequences. Um, they are more creative. They are taking this risk that we sometimes adults don't take them again or anymore. Yeah. 
and um, uh, something that interests me is that when we are looking in, at adolescence um, in the view of psychology and the cycles of development, um, we realize that sometimes we might be labeling them as rebellious mm -hmm. or as um, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, but this is just a process of exploring and trying new things. And this is helpful really for the development of the brain. Yes. yes. Yeah. I agree so. Yeah, and usually there are problems between uh, in their relationship of parents and adolescents. Mm -hmm. What makes uh, some parents smile from the beginning in the first session when uh, they start to talk? How bad is their relationship with uh, with uh, the teenager and the mother is saying? She, she just, uh, I don't recognize her. She wanted to be uh, just like me. And we had some, such a close relationship and now she's yeah. at the opposite. And I said, well, yeah. if you would come to me and your daughter was 14 and you would say to me, oh, my daughter is just like me. We are so fine together. Then I would start to raise my eyebrow. And then the mother is like, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is because of the differentiation process. It's, it's a very natural and uh, much needed process. Uh, they need to form uh, individual uh, personalities. So in order for this, I think there is uh, the necessity of, of a split. Not in that term of a split, how you use it sometimes uh, in a pathological way. Yeah. Sometimes it happens also pathologic when there is no space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the importance of psychoeducation for the parents in that, yes. at those ages. And, and, and that would help them to build the bigger capacity to, to just have let their children to, or teenagers to become, to explore more, try new things and maybe go out of the routines of the family. Yes, to break a bit the chain. Yeah, yeah. That all the adolescents are terrible. <laughs> yeah, there, there is one question here. What do you mean by limitations? I think maybe TA limitations. Can yes. you explain more? Um, I think that the first time when I thought of limitations uh, was uh, when writing my CTA paper and my supervisor asked me, Batalina, did you encounter any situation where TA was not enough? Mm. And by this, I'm referring to limitations, uh, to the subjects where there are not uh, enough information or not enough research. Yes, we can build the theory around. I think this is what I, I wish to do in the future. Uh, to combine the theory to make these bridges between Gestalt play therapy and uh, TA. Uh, I will give you another example of limitation. Uh, when I work in the orphanage, at a certain point, the pathology level was so high in the children that I worked with due to abuse, substance abuse, neglect. Um, they were children uh, from mothers who were already um, consumers of drugs and alcohol. And at a certain point, uh, I felt that TA was not enough. So more yeah. on you need um, a psychiatrist. Um, you need also other forms of uh, therapy specific for uh, severe trauma. And with this, mm. I refer to limitation, to what is not uh, known yet. With an yeah, underlying that's right. yet. Yeah, one of the things that I'm recently uh, studying about is the uh, relationship with attachment patterns and mm -hmm. TA life positions that can be somehow connected. And when I um, really understood that connection between those uh, two concepts, I realized that there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of research and aspects that it's, uh, based on attachment theory that we don't know if we just uh, stick to TA. Mm -hmm. So we can so we can study them uh, and we can maybe get that insight from them and then maybe combine it with TA. So, but there are a lot of research. There are a lot of 
uh, work that has been done, uh, we need to consider. So uh, I also like to know uh, your idea about attachment and attachment patterns, if you like. Mm, I'm thinking now if I, if I have a, um, another author than Bowlby to, uh, as a favorite author for, uh, for attachment. Mm. Yeah. I, I was passionate uh, in TA about uh, the hungers, uh, the six hungers of burn and deprivation, especially because of the work in the orphanage, because I saw that they were really deprived and the work of René Spritz and, uh, and uh, yeah. everyone in the field in the beginning. Um, I think attachment is at, at, at the base. So mm. I, I don't think I can separate it into the work. Also from mm. a relational point of view, uh, it's impossible that, for example, the child not to get attached to you in a exactly. sort or another. And it is actually needed for having a therapy. Yes, for the therapeutic al uh, alliance. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. And then you can uh, maybe uh, recognize those attachment patterns in, the, in their play or maybe yes. in the drawings or tools that they use, yeah? And in, in the way they are um, leaving the parents behind, I think this is the first time when you see their attachment style. Because hmm. when doing therapy, there is a small moment, sometimes big or long, uh, regarding the separation with the parents. There are children in the office and uh, where I worked, I had uh, the doors were from glass and uh, down you can see the legs of the parent. So there are children oh. who are all the time watching. Is my mother still there? Is she waiting for me? Yeah. And you can see it very clear that this is about a, an anxious type or style yeah. of attachment. Or others who seem that they don't mind that the parent is, is leaving. How mm -hmm. easily suits are they by me, a stranger, just like uh, yeah, in the experiment. When they yeah. remain with me and the mother says to them, hey, I'm going to come in one hour. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's, it's very easily to see. And also, if you don't see it, it's in the game. It's a, and the game that I like the more to see attachment and to create a connection is uh, the squiggle game of Winnicott. Uh, uh -huh. In which you draw something like a line or a form and the child is drawing from, you let it, from where you let it and then you're drawing again and then you create forms or yeah. all sorts of things. And uh, you are there, the child is there. It's a lot of space for both of you to create something together. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's a great exercise for modeling also. Safety. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, let me see if there are any more comments or questions maybe. Mm. No. Nope. I don't see any. <laughs> No, so people feel free to ask uh, or maybe have comments. Mm. Yeah. So some of the books that you had uh, suggested in your page on now was really new to me. I haven't even heard of that. Uh, as I said, uh, the, one of them was the, uh, the adult is the parent to the child. Yes. Yeah. Make yeah, and I, yeah, I, I wanted to uh, get an ebook of that, but uh, it, it wasn't available. No. <laughs> so, no, and I waited yeah. for the books three weeks, so they don't make it anymore. Uh, ah, they, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they have some uh, some copies left. Uh, I had uh, an exchange, uh, an email exchange with Keith Tudor, and uh, he said to me he's not working with children anymore. Oh, um, but the book is great if you have the opportunity to uh, get it. Uh, I think oh, unfortunately, I cannot have it. Uh, I cannot have a copy of that. Uh, but 
maybe if if uh, at another time the ebook would be available i don't yeah. know <laughs> yeah yeah so because he gathered uh, many people uh, who uh, contributed to the book like uh, mark widerson um, kit tudor also a uh, therapist from england Uh, mm. and the topics are are very different and um really interesting like child protection and how do you work in different settings and um i think that almost each author has a different style to work with the children and from what oh. i observe everyone is adding something to the ta approach a yeah. bit of something yeah that's what's happening in different schools Yes, I think it's great uh to add more value uh through another theory or more theories just to enrich your practice. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and is it about of adolescents the book or is it also about children? Children and adolescents both. Both. Yeah. So maybe that is a good reference for using mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Um so I also wanted to ask you about the parenting. I think you mentioned a little bit about that. I do want to say more a little more, bit more how do you educate people for this parenting at different stages and different levels of the cycles of development. Mm-hmm. Um I think it was um almost 8 or 9 years ago um my mm-hmm. first my first project and my longest one uh was working um in a project uh named emotional intelligence for children and oh, yeah i i wanted to teach children about emotions uh and i did this in schools uh in the hometown where i lived and as soon as i started uh, i realized that it's not only the children that i need to teach them about emotions i need to talk with the yeah. parents yeah yeah and i liked a lot to have these meetings with the parents uh, to talk about cycles of development why it's important to let the children to to have their emotions and why not to stop them what is good what is bad emotions etc yeah uh, because i realized that as a therapist you sometimes sit in your office and you don't know what is happening outside so mm. you know very good the theory you know the practice but uh, what is happening outside what are people thinking what is the trend and i have no idea uh, how it is in your country but uh, it's in romania for example there is a big boom of parenting advices books uh, specialists mm. it's making yeah. the people the parents so confused uh so confused and ashamed i am a bad yeah. parent because i'm screaming to my child uh, i don't do this i'm going to traumatize my child forever yeah uh, i think this this was the reason that kept me doing uh parenting workshops <clears throat> but i have a um, i think i like more to do the the parenting groups where we work in a more safe environment uh, mm-hmm. with a good structure but also with enough time to let the parents explore what are the parts that they are bringing in their um, journey in parenthood yeah and this is a very important thing you said about shaming yes yeah and last week i was talking to adrian and he said that i realized i needed um a course of compassion before i have my ta 101 <laughs> because i had i was exploring a lot of things in myself uh but not in a compassionate way so uh, um, i think it's the same for parents who maybe uh, are confronting those things mm-hmm. and how they are really relating to their children have this confrontation in a comp- compassionate way yeah and i think it's something that we we have to learn if we yeah. we haven't been raised in a compassionate style 
And I think yeah. it's, compassion is not the first word when uh, when you refer to Romanian parents. I think uh, not even to Dutch parents. Uh, maybe Chris uh, Mueller can uh, can say this. She, I see that she is here. Hello, Chris. Yeah. I think compassion is uh, for some someone is uh, um, for some uh, parents is uh, such a new um, concept that they are asking me, what is compassion? How do you do it? What is yeah. connection with the child? What is connection with yourself? Mm -hmm. And if this is the the level of uh, emotional literacy, then this is the base where you need to start to add more and more in small steps. Yeah, and and Chris, it says that uh, how, yeah, compassion is so new for most parents, also in Holland. Yeah. Yeah, she's doing a great uh, job as well uh, as a practitioner. Also TA. Yeah, oh, oh, I didn't know that. So Yeah. Good to see you here, Chris. <laughs> um there's one question. What parts of the TA do you think uh, are useful for working with anxious children? Uh if I think of uh, in terms of um of concepts mm. first thing that came to my mind uh, is the permission yeah. and is mm. the permission to feel fear and to feel oh. fear until the end yeah the permission to to feel the emotions mm. so that's when you realize this there's a difference between fear and anxiety Mm -hmm. yeah yeah a uh, second thing that that came to my mind uh regarding after the permission is uh to build uh a good enough nurturing parent when this anxiety uh -huh. arises yeah a nurturing parent who is not going to um say bad things about you because you're being anxious but uh, mm -hmm. uh, a nurturing parent who is going to say to yourself okay this is anxiety let's see what we can do together we can mm. breathe we can count it's okay to feel what you feel feelings come and feelings go yeah and for me this is uh, the work that you do and concentrate especially on the resources of the child and less on the symptom. Yeah. Because yeah. I think the biggest muscle of a child is this nurturing parent. Yeah, yeah. And this is really connected with the nurturing parent in the parent in, exactly. or in the mother. Yes, yes, yes. Because what uh, the other says, uh, say to us is going to be the internal dialogue that the we are internal. going to create. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the first one is the permission. And then this is the building of a uh, nurturing parent, focusing mm -hmm. on the inner resources. I think I would, I would also, um, I don't remember if, uh, okay, in children, yes, because with adolescents, I would integrate more, more of the adults. Uh, hmm. But with the children, uh, as I said, sometimes if you integrate more and more of the adult, because this is what they are doing. Uh, I was worse, once working with a child and he was really, really afraid of the uh, characters from Minecraft. So he was oh. terrified. He was eight uh, at that time. And the parents uh, said to me, we tried everything. Uh, he mm. was afraid that these characters are going to come uh, to the wires until his bed and he's going to be attacked during the night. He was a, a brilliant child, a very smart one. And the parents used all the adult explanation they could use, like what are the wires yeah. made of everything. So nothing worked from this adult part. So we, we made, uh, uh, in order to increase this muscle of the nurturing parent, what we do, we, we made a weapon. 
uh, a weapon yeah. for this character. So he started to sleep with the weapon. The weapon was made from uh, paper and clay and all sorts of, of things that uh, he could find in my office. Yeah, mm. yeah, beautiful, yeah. That's right, so and how's remember, it different? Yeah, yeah, and I remember even now what he said to me. Uh, he said to me, I'm coming to you because you understand me and you don't say to me that this is bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, I know that these are not existing, but I'm still afraid. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, we need to have some uh, power from inside in this fight. Yeah, yeah. It's like when you understand their world, you're talking to them in their language mm -hmm. and how they see that or maybe building those inner resources in their way. Yeah, but uh, as you say, in adolescence, it's different. You work more on the cognition, how they think, maybe how they separate ideas. Do you want to say some anxiety, more? Yeah. yeah, with anxiety in, uh, in teenagers, because I'm, I'm preparing them uh, for the national exams. And usually they have the age of 14 when they are giving these national exams. And uh, what I like to, to use a lot with them um, uh, is the model of uh, the seagull of the brain. So either yeah. that we, we draw a house with three The hand levels, model? The hand model, but with them I use it with the house. Uh, so we oh. have the first layer, the second layer, and the, the third layer. Uh, because they could, uh, yeah. they could draw in this house what mm -hmm. they can use to self-suit themselves at three different levels. Three. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. they can uh, use to self-suit themselves in an exam, for example, at the bodily level and the sensation level. When they are feeling that their heart is going to in a race or sweaty hands or very cold hands or lack of air uh, the second floor what to do about the emotions when the brain is entering uh, in the black mood there is nothing there yeah what they put to the mansard or the, the third level uh, and this is like the, the most important that they are going to use in the exam combining informations and everything that is regarding to the neurocortex yeah and maybe and their beliefs and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a really beautiful metaphor you use. Have you remembered that really? I find that the, the thing with the heart, I think it's very good for us adults because we understand things differently. But uh, I think teenagers, even if we consider Levin's model, this model of regeneration, she's saying mm -hmm. like this, for example, a, a teenager between 13 and 14, sometimes it's like a child between four and six. And four and uh -huh. six, we have... Um, the identity level and identity, power. yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of power struggle. Alina, you don't tell me about this uh, brain thing and whatever. I need to see it. I need to put things in my own house. I need to remember things in my own way. Hmm. And I think their language sometimes is still symbolic. Yeah. And the biggest thing that that uh, sometimes we can. Um, how to say, um, the, the biggest misleading things with adolescents is to believe that they are almost adults. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes they are talking like this, they are dressing like this, they are using fancy words, and you can be caught in this thing to treat them like adults. Oh, he is understanding. But actually, yeah, but that's a very common issue you're explaining. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, so I like the idea of using imagery or the right brain or using those metaphors so to help them rather yeah. than just using those uh, cognitive ones. I think this is the, the thing that I took more uh, from the Gestalt play therapy. It's a, a, a technique based on uh, creativity and express, expressions uh, way to, to do things. Especially in therapy, we use drawing, pen, painting, clay, everything mm. that uh, has to do with sensorial work. Uh, and yeah. it's working great, especially with, uh, with children, adolescents and the others. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so 
There is one comment. I will read that for you. Uh, I think it's a good idea to teach kindergarten teachers the TA theory, not to talk with children by logical language. Uh, too much logical explanation that are not useful at all. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think we, we touched this subject in the first part. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't see sometimes the, the relevance of specific TA language. I think it's important for the children in kindergarten to have the permission to feel, uh, hmm. to play a lot regarding uh, permissions, um, to explore, uh, to think, and to find lots of games regarding this uh, identity and power struggles. Because most of the uh, children that I work with in kindergarten are coming uh, in the therapy with this problem of uh, power. Who am I? Um. And what can I do with my power? And my superpower as a child of four or five is to cry or to hit or to speak really bad. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, re it's really uh, starts in the level of doing Yes. The level of doing it according to that model. And then it, it really leads the child to that identity level. Yes, yes, yes. And, and the, the main things that you can say to a child is you're mean. Or such a good child. You hmm. learn so fast. But then the child is saying, uh, um, Mama, I want to pee on you. And hmm. what do you say to that? Because... Also, four years old, four or five, is the preferred age of children to speak toilet language. So they are going to challenge mm. you a lot. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That, and that's when the confusion happens. In them and also in the parents. Yeah, yeah. So maybe when they're getting to those uh, paradoxical behaviors leading to the paradoxical labels or maybe yes. beliefs about them. Uh, so there is one thing. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I agree what, uh, what uh, heaven is saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let me read that because uh, okay. the comments won't be available on the video. I used uh, use it to um, in the with the kindergarten children uh, teacher, and I truly know that it's nerve uh, wracking for a child. <laughs> and also for the teacher, I would say, yeah. Yeah. So we we almost had one hour, Alina. Wow. Uh, <laughs> It, uh, it went so fast, I think, at this point. I was going to ask you how it went. <laughs> yeah, at this moment, we have uh, one minute mm -hmm. till uh, it's one hour. So if there's any questions or comments, uh, feel free to uh, put it here. Otherwise, we can end it. Is there anything else you want to add, Alina? Something that comes to your mind? Mm. I made a list. Oh, <laughs> uh, I will finish my idea. I made a list of authors um, because some of them are for me uh, really known and uh, I know about them even in my sleep, but some of them uh, not. Yeah. That you can find in the uh, TAG. So you can search by articles. It was useful to me. And I want to read that list that maybe somebody is inspired to work with children. And that would be great. That is great. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Please do that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, first on the top is Pierini, which is also uh, one of my favorite supervisors. Uh, mm -hmm. Then is Dolores Munari Poda. She has lots of articles uh, mm -hmm. on TAG. Uh, I liked a lot the Italian therapist Stefano Morena. Uh, he uh, he's having an article with working with transactions with children. So it's really on the point. Different mm. types of transactions. 
Uh, unfortunately, Romanini is not translated, but you can find uh, other articles related to this. Okay. Uh, there is the work of uh, Levin and Clark with the um, cycle of development. Uh, there is the work of Steiner, uh, because stroke economy mm -hmm. and the warm fuzzy tail, uh, it's a yeah. very um, good one. Uh, what do I have more? Uh, Muriel James. I think mm -hmm. lots of the exercises she proposes uh, could be uh, useful for working with adolescents. And Campos, because he wrote about script and how you can uh, work with the script and prevent some things in the script of a child. Hmm. Uh, the idea of prevention that you mentioned, is this from him? I think so. Hmm. I think so, it is from him. Yes, uh, also Pierin mentioned it and uh, also in Gestalt, uh, there is a lot about prevention. Gestalt therapy. Ah, okay. That is so useful. Thank you. So Welcome. let me read, read those comments for you. We learned so much from you. Great to know you here. Oh, thank, thank you both. You. <laughs> and thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Yeah, it was so... easier than I, I was expected. <laughs> I had <laughs> <good> emotions. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I hope it will be easier for maybe some future work or maybe mm -hmm. some future uh, things you do. I Thank like, you again, Alina. Uh, I really fun. enjoyed it. And I really learned from you. Uh, most of it was really new to me. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about it. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning those authors and uh, books. That would be very useful. Yeah. So I will put this video on YouTube as well. So if people okay. um, yeah, are interested, they can search and find it. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, have a good time and have, have a good evening. Yeah. As well. As well. Ciao. <laughs> uh, yeah. Bye for now. So.